Movement and Education. Let's start with a review of the literature. Justifications for Movement from Biology Though the earliest realization of the benefits of movement for learning had their roots in common sense observation, modern biological research has begun to support the implementation. The use of movement in education is being justified by using biology to examine the physical attributes which support positive cognitive functioning. A common finding is that there is a connection between movement and many neurological functions. Biological studies have suggested many negative effects of immobility and are typically cited in support of kinesthetic learning. Perhaps the greatest negative effect of immobility is the lack of circulation caused by sitting in non-ergonomic chairs for long periods of time. His commonality is perhaps best summarized by Jensen. The human body for the last 400,000 years has primarily been walking, sleeping, leaning, running, doing, or squatting. The typical student who sits much of the day runs the following risks, poor breathing, strained spinal column, and lower back nerves, poor eyesight, and overall body fatigue. Within the field of psychology, there are numerous studies examining the effects of movement on brain functioning. Studies that examine the effects of movement on learning often are examining infants or youth. These studies suggest that movement has a positive effect on cognitive abilities. Additionally, there are studies showing that movement creates specific neurological benefits. According to Sprenger's book, Learning and Memory, The Brain in Action, movement increases dendrite production, which in turn provides greater brain functioning. Additional studies support the idea that movement and exercise produces hormones like dopamine which can create learner focus and attentiveness. There is now a call by Andrew Hawking for different disciplines to come together to benefit the educating of human beings. Hawking suggests that there, through theological assertions that at the center of all quality experience is doing. Hawking suggests that at the center of many psychological and educational practices is kinesthetic learning. Using movement in education. Within the field of education, there has been a growing belief that movement can create positive results in the classroom. In fact, there are federally funded programs, such as Brain Gym, that pro promote the usage of movement for learning. These programs have been suggested to have positive influences on student achievement and behaviors. However, there are some that dispute the successes of such programs, yet their opinions are often based upon the loose association between claimed science of the program and the educational benefits. There are traditional settings where kinesthetic learning is encouraged, such as the physical education classroom and vocational classes. In these settings, there is a consistent history of kinesthetic learning having a positive influence. Today, however, there is a move towards using these settings and kinesthetic activities to encourage more knowledge-based learning. In addition, kinesthetic is being used to support more statistic technological education such as computers. Also, in core curriculum and special education settings, the use of movement has been found beneficial. There exists much evidence in the literature about movement-based studies, increasing student behaviors, cooperative learning, and attitudes towards school. Additionally, movement-based education has been found to increase student achievement in the areas of literacy, fluency, and language acquisition. The benefits of movement for learning have now been expanded beyond the classroom and into other educational settings such as museums. There is a new program called Museum Movement Techniques that combines visual kinesthetic strategies in order to create understanding. Exhibits created with this program have been found to have positive benefits for visitors. Overall, the usage of movement as a tool for learning is supported by biological and psychological studies showing positive behavioral and academic results. The study focused on the effects of movement on student achievement and focus. The study would involve three sections of seventh graders and explore two types of movement, intermittent movement and continual movement. Intermittent movement is movement which occurs at regularly scheduled intervals. Continual movement is ongoing opportunities for movement. Student achievement is an improved level of knowledge and understanding. 
The first section of 7th graders would be our intermittent movement. They would receive 30 second breaks to move every 10 minutes. The second section of 7th graders would be our control. They would be given no extra opportunities to move. The last section of 7th graders would have 8 students selected for the studying of continual movement. Four of those students would be given exercise balls to move on throughout class. Four other students would be given regular seats. The students selected all had comparable histories of student achievement as measured by our study. The data took three forms during our study. First, daily six question assessments on key knowledge from the class before were given for three weeks before the study in the three weeks of the study. Second, the traditional measurement of student achievement grades were collected for the three weeks before the study and three weeks of the study. Lastly, while examining continual movement, time on task tallies were taken every 10 minutes of class. The results are as follows for intermittent movement. The intermittent movement group experienced an increase of 19.42% more than the control class in daily retention of information from the class before. Additionally, the intermittent group saw an increase of 0.81% for grade average more than the control class. As displayed in this chart, class 1 had a class average on daily assessments of 3.88 for the three weeks before the study, yet they had increased to 4.66 at the end of the study. This is an increase of 20.27%. Class 2 had a class average on daily assessments of 3.9 before the study and 3.93 at the end of the study, an increase of only 0.85%. As is more clearly visible by this graph, the intermittent group had an increase in class average of 19.42% more than the control group. Though it is difficult to see in this chart, when collecting data on the traditional measurement of student achievement grades, the intermittent movement class saw an increase of 1.54% from before the study until the end, compared to only 0.74% for the control class. As is more clearly visible by this graph, the intermittent group only saw an increase of 0.81% in average more than the control. The results are as follows for continual movement. Those students who were in our continual movement group witnessed an increase of 14.41% in daily retention more than the control. When measuring grade average, the continual group had an increase of 6.52% more than the control. Additionally, these students in the continual movement group were on task 7.91% more than the control. As seen by this chart, no student in the intervention group received less than a 3% increase in grade average, compared to those students in the control group where no student had an increase more than 1.12%. The continual movement students had an overall increase in grade average of 5.41%, compared to a total decrease in average of 1.11% in the control group. As is clear in this graph, the intervention group had significant increases in grade average compared to the control. As you can see here, the continual movement group as a whole made significant gains, 14.41% over the control. As can be seen in this chart, all students in the control saw an increase in daily assessment scores compared to only three students in the control. As can be seen in this graph, the intervention group saw all students increase at least 5% and as much as 41%. As can be seen in this graph, the control experienced an overall decrease in daily assessment scores compared to an increase of 14% for the continual movement group. As can be seen in this chart above, the students who had used exercise balls were on task an average of 95% of the time. This compares to 87.5% of the time for the control group. As can still be seen by this graph, the continuous movement group was on task 7.5% more. In conclusion, upon examination, it can be assumed that movement had a positive effect on student achievement.
The data shows that continual movement is the more effective strategy for increasing traditional achievement. With an increase of more than 4.29% over the control compared to only 0.81% over the control for intermittent movement, the difference is clear. However, the benefits of intermittent movement appear to have a greater impact when measuring the retention of daily knowledge and content. Though both strategies had sizable impact, intermittent movement showed an increase of 19.42% more than the control, while continuous movement had 14.44% over the control. There were high levels of student focus for the group experiencing continual movement when compared to the control, 7.91% more. The study suggests that there are indeed measurable effects of movement on education, and there exist possible areas where we can further study the effects of movement on education.